Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most interesting and uh, future-focused thinkers on. And today, I think we definitely have one of them, Dr. Bill Walsh. Thanks for coming today, Dr. Walsh. Hi, Matt. Glad to be with you. And I'm glad to have you. We agreed that we'll call you Bill, so we'll, we'll roll with that. So, Bill, yeah. I wanted to have you on the program because while we look oftentimes at far-out future projections of what the world is going to look like, it's also a big part of the future we create is the internals of how we are, how we feel about ourselves, mental health. And all of these have been really big in the news lately. We've had lots of shootings. We've had lots of problems with society. And I was fascinated by a podcast interview I heard with you. So tell me a little bit more about you and your background. How did you get into this, this strange and uh, interesting world? I really got into this by accident. I started in Notre Dame, got a, a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, then when I went to grad school at Michigan, I got really interested in, in nuclear science and got a couple of master's degrees, um, chemical engineering, nuclear engineering, got involved. Um, I've never really been a chemical engineer. I got a PhD in chemical engineering, but I've, I've worked in nuclear science. I've worked in electrochemistry, battery development. Um, and when I was a young man working, I had worked at Los Alamos, a place called the Institute for Atomic Research. Um, in other places, Argonne National Laboratory, I got interested in, in volunteer work. And at the time I was doing this as a young person, a lot of my friends were volunteering for this and that, Peace Corps, getting involved in social, act, you know, social um, um, history and, and trying, to help, trying to help humanity. And I decided to be a volunteer. And, uh, and a woman in my neighborhood was senselessly murdered in Joliet, Illinois, and I decided to try to get involved in, in crime prevention in that general area. And so eventually I became a volunteer at Stateville Penitentiary, which is one of the toughest prisons in America. And my feeling was that if, if I'm going to make any kind of an impact, I should go directly to the people most likely to commit a crime. And those are people leaving prison. And so I became a prison volunteer, uh, did this on my own. My first, the first person I got to know was a man who was on death row. And I got to know him because I was also president of the Argonne chess team. And we thought we had uh, the, the best chess team in the side of New York City, New York. And uh, we, we played the prison just to warm up for the next season. And the guy I played was this fellow who just got off death row. And uh, one thing led to another. And he uh, gave me a long list of things they needed. I told him I would, I would like to do something to try to help him. And uh, I spent the next 18 years of my life on that list. I became a prison volunteer, and I got to know uh, lots of people who were terribly violent, who had done terrible things. And uh, I began to um, I, I began to find out and learn that they were different from the time they were born. That was the big surprise for me. Eventually, I had a team of uh, 125 people in my group, in our, my volunteer group, and. Um, what happened was uh, my, my, my education started when we started an ex-offender program to help people leaving prison. So we figured that was the time to really try to help somebody. And uh, what we, we, the worst thing you want is to have these very dangerous people who know how to make a lot of money and how to commit crimes. You don't want them to be hungry and homeless. So we thought the best thing we could do is help them find jobs, make sure that they had, a, a, you know, when they, when they got out, they had a decent place to live and, and try to help them find jobs. My, my education started when I, when I did this and got to meet the parents and the families that had produced a criminal. That was the big surprise for me. I had always thought that criminals became criminals because of life experiences, lack of love, inner city, uh, that sort of thing, traumatic experiences. What I learned, the, the parents told me they were, these kids were different from the time they were six weeks old or certainly by six months old, and that they, they, um, they had other children and other siblings, and these kids were different. They were oppositional, they were defiant, they were violent, they, would, they, they might torture the family pet. Uh, they were just different, which was a big surprise to me. So then having, since I was an experimentalist working at Argonne National Laboratory, I decided to do some experiments. I, I was working with all these really violent people I had several people on death row that I knew quite well. Uh, and I started doing chemical testing. I, I wanted to know whether or not their biochemistry was different. 
So uh, with the help of some volunteers who um, actually were prisoners, I started collecting uh, t samples, uh, hair samples. And then with the ex-offenders, I got blood and urine samples and just started a experimental sort of thing looking, just trying to see if, if they were different. And they were. I found out that, that their mental metabolism was extraordinarily different and imbalanced. And I started uh, by doing a, a double blind controlled study of 24 siblings, children in the Chicago area where one of them was a violent delinquent child, you might say a child from hell, and a brother in the same environment who was beautifully behaved and, and a good student. And uh, when, I, when we did this double blind controlled study, we found, we found the differences. We found some really clear differences in body chemistry. We learned that those, those very differences have a lot to do with brain function. And that's how I started. And that was a long time ago. And since then, uh, eventually I got really excited about doing this instead of the research I was doing. Uh, I was working, for example, on, on nuclear fuel reprocessing, which went really well. I got a couple of nice patents on that. Uh, but I, I got disillusioned with nuclear science, thinking that not necessarily was going to be good for society. Uh, I got interested in uh, electric cars and artificial hearts, and I, I got a patent on, on the lithium battery a long, long, long time ago, for which I got $50 and, and a letter of commendation. Um, the government owned it, of course. Um, but then I, I got really interested in why people are violent. What's, what, why are if they are different, and I was con convinced by them that they were, how and why? And that's how I started. And I started a not-for-profit um, public charity. And eventually, I decided I wanted to quit my job as a as, as an Argonne scientist and just focus on the science of, of brain function. And uh, that was a very long time ago. I eventually started a clinic that saw uh, 30,000 mentally ill people. Everything from depression, violent, violent children and adults, autism, and um, one thing I've always done is I've been a collector of chemistries. I think I have the world's biggest database for chemistry, blood and urine chemistry for behavior, for depression, certainly for autism and schizophrenia. And you learn a lot from, from, from the, these databases. You learn that these people were in fact born different. We, we are all born different because of, um, not because our DNA is necessarily different, but this thing called epigenetics where we have, um, where, where we have variations in gene expression that, that determine our, our behaviors. It uh, has a lot to do with our height and, and, and but really more with our personality and our behavior control. And, and our brain function. And so it's, it's been, I find it a, a really interesting and exciting, but also there are people that need help. And so uh, I've sort of now, I guess, become more of a neuroscientist than, than what I had been doing before. And I've learned that, um, that problems like depression and, and schizophrenia and even behavior disorders, um, many of them involve chemical imbalances that involve nutrient imbalances, and that and that we can we we with our thirty thousand patients, we we found that we were able to help people who were on on very powerful psychiatric drugs that might have anxiety or depression, or or you know some psychiatric diagnosis. We could help a lot of them just by simply correcting their the nutrient chemistry. We found out that there were seven chemical imbalances that dominated mental health, mental functioning, which is great because there are hundreds and hundreds of, of biochemical factors a human has, but there's only about seven that really dominate with respect to imbalances that, that screw up or mess up their brain function and their behavior and their, and their mental health. So uh, we've developed a, a system now that uh, is working quite well. We have a protocol now of a medical protocol where we've developed a system for doing the lab testing to identify the chemistry, a, a very careful um, a medical history to learn the symptoms and traits that they have, because that gives a lot of clues to their chemistry. And then we developed protocols, nutrient protocols, to fix their chemistry. 
For example, uh, postpartum depression. We now know what postpartum depression is. And it's, it's not, has nothing to do with serotonin or, or dopamine or the usual neurotransmitters. It has to do with a, with a uh, genetic flaw in a protein called metallothionine. We know how to fix it now without drugs. So we've now taken about, I think it's 300. We've tested and treated 300 women who had postpartum depression. And, and we're about 90 plus percent successful in basically fixing it. So, so it, you know, postnatal depression can, can last a lifetime for people who get it. We can fix that. We've also discovered with our depression database that depression is an umbrella term that, that uh, is, is really used for about five completely different conditions. Uh, mainstream psychiatry has the misconception that, that depression is a, a single um, entity that basically it, it has to do, they, they believe it has to do especially with, with low serotonin activity um, however, that's only one of these five phenotypes. So throughout the world, if a person gets clinical depression diagnosis, usually they start on an antidepressant. Well, it's great for the phenotype that involves low serotonin activity, but it's not too good for the rest of them, which is more than 50% of them don't have that kind of depression. We now know, uh, we've now been able to identify the, the unique distinctive chemistry abnormalities in the different kinds of depression. And, and the, the, we have, one thing we've been doing is um, training doctors how to do this. My goal originally was to train a thousand doctors or throughout the world. Or actually by the end of this year, by the end of next year, we expect to have about 750 to 800. So we're almost there. We've got, we now have doctors from um, more than 30 countries that are, have been trained in our protocols. Uh, we, we have training sessions. Uh, I'll be in Australia in, in, in uh, April training another 80 to 100 doctors. And then the same month, I'll come back to the U.S. and Evanston, Illinois. Um, myself and my team will be training another 80, more than 80 doctors to do this. And, and the doctors that do this say we've changed their lives, changed their medical practice. They now can help patients they couldn't help before. They don't have to just throw drugs at a patient. They can, they can do lab work, find out which neurotransmitters are misbehaving, and, and they know how to adjust neurotransmitter activity using nutrients. So I guess that's a summary of it all. And I need to inject something here, guys. So Dr. Walsh is running a nonprofit. This isn't something that he's selling. He's training people how to do this and making a fortune doing it. Now, this is, this is the anti-pharma. It's the big problem. The pharma industry, essentially, the only way where they're able to make money is on billion-dollar drugs. Is that why people... I mean, why, why would some random guy like you, however many years ago, be able to figure this out when companies are making billions of dollars? Were they just not looking? It started innocently. Uh, up until the year 1965, uh, we sort of had a Freudian approach to mental, mental health and mental functioning. And, and the thought was mainly that people had these problems because of life experiences. And so counseling and that sort of approach was number one. And then right around that time, science came to the fore. And we learned that with careful experiments, they found out that, that really what was uh, the main problem for these people was their neurotransmission and their receptors and, and, and the, 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 biology, the biology of the brain, not life experiences quite so much. They found out in, in, in for example, in adoption studies that identical twins separated at birth tended to have the same, the same uh, tendencies for depression or schizophrenia or behavior or autism. And, and so they learned that really it's brain chemistry and brain biology, not life experiences that was the main, the main issue. What, what, yes, a, a lousy uh, background and, and trauma, especially early on, can really mess up anyone. But the main issue is your inborn tendencies that have to do with chemistry. Uh, so that, that was 1965. Well, this was kind of hard to be a psychiatrist in 1966 because can you imagine spending eight years learning how to help people with mental problems and you'd learned all these psychodynamic and counseling tactics 
And then your profession comes to you and says, uh, sorry, but uh, everything we taught you is not really what you need to do. It's really, we need to change their, their, their brain chemistry and their, because of these chemical imbalances. Well, at that time, there are all these people who were desperately in need of help. And the only thing they knew that could really impact the brain were medications. So it started innocently, and they were able to help a lot of people. It was okay until 1985, which is you know, a little more than 30 years ago, when they learned, no, it's not bad. It's really this thing called reuptake, and it has to do with sort of a complicated way in which um, uh, neurotransmitters make their way back to the original brain cell that they came from during, a, during when, when a brain cell fires. Uh, I don't want to get into the complexity of it, but anyway, uh, what happened is uh, since that time, there is an enormous amount of money and profit in this. There are probably 20 to $30 billion drugs. And so now you have these huge pharmacy companies that are making incredible amounts of money on these drugs. And, and they're always trying to find the next billion dollar drug. And I don't blame them. They have, they have shareholders and they would, like, they would like to maintain their profitability. The problem is they become such a huge behemoth they, they don't seem to have nearly enough interest in what is wrong, what is causing these problems, and the neuroscience of what precisely is wrong, rather than developing, usually by trial and error, but to a large extent, drugs that can help some people and, and make their company billions of dollars. So it kind of now, it started innocently, and now it's, uh, and, and medications have helped millions of people. I've met depressed people who told me that, that they probably would have committed suicide if a drug hadn't helped them. However, it's, I, I think that as science advances and as our knowledge and our neuroscience advances, we'll, we'll learn how to fix these problems without drugs. The problem with psychiatric medications, you're putting a, a powerful foreign molecule in the brain. And these things are powerful and they change brain function and they, they have side effects. They automatically have side effects. Now, if you're lucky, the side effects might be mild and, and maybe the medication will be great for you. But it's not really science. It's more trial and error. You talk to almost any psychiatrist, and they'll try one medication that they think is the most promising and it'll go to you know, a whole raft of others. If you talk to people with mental illness, uh, you probably find they're on four or five medications and they're still not doing really well. That's what I've normally found so it's that's hi it's hiding symptoms people. versus fixing the fixing the cause essentially yes they to some extent they try to fix the cause if they they, they they for depression they usually focus on they think the cause is low serotonin activity so they've got these medications like prozac paxil serozone on and on that can in, increase serotonin neurotransmission but um uh, a lot of these, a lot of these are, are uh, you might say, empirical. They, they don't really understand. There's a lot of medications uh, that, that are used all the time by millions of people where they don't really know how they work or why they work. All they know is that they, they, they test well in these studies. It's so, it, in other words, it's, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to fight an enemy if you don't know who it is or what it is. Uh, a good example is bipolar disorder. Um, I worked with my colleagues, we worked with 1,600 people with bipolar, and frankly, we didn't understand what it was. Nobody, there's so many mysteries associated with bipolar. Nobody knows why, 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 why it starts. I mean, a lot of these people are completely okay until they're about 18. All of a sudden, they become manic. Why? What's going on in the brain? Why doesn't it go away after onset? Once you become, once you have classic bipolar, you've got that challenge the rest of your life. Why? Um, and, and then why, why does it violate Mendelian genetics, which it does? Why? Um, there, there are all these mysteries associated with it. Uh, I think the answer really is to, there's some wonderful neuroscience going on around the world. Unfortunately, most of it's not in the USA. And, and they're learning more and more and more about how the brain functions. They're learning about glial cells and about, about uh, ion channel functions and things that are they're really getting detail and understanding what, how the brain works, why it works well, and how it can go wrong. And right there, I think, is the roadmap for helping people, probably without drugs. That's, I think that's the future. I think as science advances, I think psychiatric medications will fade away and we'll learn how to correct these things in a natural fashion.
I sure hope so. We've had so many school shootings in the U.S. recently. Talk a little bit about the, the crime stats and then a little bit deeper in terms of how nutrient imbalances cause people to, for lack of a better word, lose their minds. Right. Um, the, the research on the violent people uh, led to a collaboration with the great Carl Pfeiffer, who in the 80s was considered the, the world's leading expert on nutrient and mental health out of Princeton, New Jersey. And he was sort of my mentor at the time. And, and uh, we, I started sending him extraordinarily violent people out on parole. We would travel together to New Jersey and his clinic and he would study them, identify their brain chemistry, and then we would put them on treatment programs. What we found was that we never really succeeded with the adults. We, we, we were able generally, if they would take the treatment and fix their chemistry, they generally would report for six or eight months that they were a lot better. And then about five years later, we'd find them back in prison and they would tell me that they were sorry they didn't continue the treatment. And we're not sure exactly why, but we found that in testing and treating children with the same chemistry, the sociopathic children, and believe me, there are millions of them, even in the U.S. alone, uh, plus others who had um, episodic rage disorder and other forms of, we found tremendously high success rates in, and we've now done two double blind studies for this and published them. We our nutrient therapy is extremely, uh, we have clear evidence that it is extremely successful in, in, in um, fixing these problems for children. And what we think is that uh, our data show that the success rate declines starting after puberty. And we think that it has to do with, um, with a uh, ingrained mental image where they think of themselves as someone who does bad things. And the other thing is they get into drugs and alcohol. And once they start abusing alcohol and drugs, it's much harder for us to fix them, not just us, but even people, psychiatrists with drug therapies, it's a lot harder to help people. So our focus since 1992 has been on children. We're, 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 our, our, we're out there trying to spread the word and show doctors how to help children who are violent, the future criminals of the world, and help them uh, uh, straighten our lives out, straighten your brain chemistry out, and you can do it without drugs, usually. How does your... So as far, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to talk about school shootings. Uh, we published a paper about three years ago um, and presented it at the American Psychiatric Association annual meeting in New York City, um, 18,000 18, psychiatrists from all over the world, and uh, I presented the, the chemistry and data and showed that there were five completely different types of depression. One of these types of depression are people that have excessive serotonin activity. And if they get an SSRI antidepressant, they will get worse. Some of them will become suicidal and homicidal. And I think that's what is causing most school shootings. And I told the group that. Uh, people have done studies. I've got colleagues uh, and myself. We have looked at the last 50 school shootings in America. More than 40 cases involved kids who were pretty much okay, didn't have a behavior problem or violence problem until they became, had anxiety and depression and were given an SSRI, a Prozac or a Paxil or a Zoloft, and got worse, dramatically worse, they would often go back to their psychiatrist and who'd say, well, I guess we have to increase the dosage. And um, if, if anybody buys uh, an antidepressant today, uh, they'll give you an insert warning you that young people, especially males, might become suicidal, have suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation. Looking at those 50 cases, more than 40, I think it's 42 or 43 of them, seemed to be okay until they got on the wrong medication. So what I'm proposing uh, for, for reducing school shootings, uh, and I'm, I'm being criticized, by the way, by some people, uh, I don't think it's going to happen by getting rid of the guns. We have 300 million guns in the USA, and even if we could decide to do it as a country, it would take forever to get rid of them. I also don't think you're going to do this certainly quickly by trying to identify people who have mental illness or are unreliable in keeping the guns away from them, I don't, I think that's really hard to do. What do you do about people who have a mental breakdown? 
who had guns and then they have a mental breakdown. Now they got the guns in there. Like you said, they've lost their mind. I think, I think the real answer is to, is to identify the specific chemistry that people have that must not get an SSRI. And we, we can do that with inexpensive blood tests. We can do that with blood tests that costs about $150, $200 that any lab can, that any good lab can do. And we, and a, so that's what, what we're teaching psychiatrists. We are, our, our training program is now one of our major activities. Our most enthusiastic doctors are the psychiatrists who are learning. No, they don't, they, they don't just have a half an hour with a new patient and try to decide what, what drug to give them. They now can do some blood work find out which neurotransmitters are misbehaving. And, and, and if it happens to be this one type of people, they get more violent after an SSRI, they, they can avoid that and give them the right medication or give them art therapy. So basically up until today, psychiatrists have more or less been operating. It's the same they have 200 years ago with at the exception of medical, some type of some type of drug, essentially, uh, mostly SSRIs to block serotonin up reuptake. Now we're moving into an era, at least ideally we're moving into an era where people are starting to understand much more of the causes of both mental and physical well-being and sickness. Um, it, seems, it seems a ton of it is caused by epigenetics, either nutrients, your environment, et cetera. How do you deal with other people that are focused on similar related areas of health, mental health, physical performance, et cetera? Well, I like to talk to them and, ex and, and exchange ideas and exchange thoughts and make them aware of this possibility. Uh, nobody has perfect knowledge, and certainly not them and no one, um, but they need to know this. And really, we're learning more and more that a lot of the major problems, including cancer and schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress, we're learning autism, for example, we're learning that they have a lot to do with your DNA deteriorating with time that with oxidative attack, assault on our DNA, a lot of people don't realize your DNA is nourishing every cell in your body, every second you're alive. And this nourishment involves enzymes and proteins that are genetically expressed. And, and most, most of these complex disorders happen when your DNA stops doing the job right. And it's called because of epigenetics. And, and the, the chemicals that go to every cell in your body are now not the, not, not the nutrients that you need to perform. And if this happens to be happening in your brain and your, your, your glial cells and your, and your neurons, your brain neurons, your brain cells, if they start malfunctioning, it might be because, it often is because of this. We're convinced that's the case in schizophrenia, in bipolar, post-traumatic stress, and we know it's what's happening in cancer. The cancer researchers are leading the way with epigenetics, and that's where most of the really great research is going on. I go to conferences once in a while pretending to be a cancer researcher because I want to know this science and start applying it to mental health. And we have started applying it to mental health. We now know, for example, there are nutrients that act as serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's, that's, what, an, that's what an SSRI is. That's what an antidepressant is. We know that serotonin, that, I'm sorry, that this thing called SAMI, which is a, a nutrient you can get at a health food store, methionine or serotonin reup in, in, inhibitors by an epigenetic mechanism. Our first epigenetic mechanism, I think I was the first person in the world to ever do a nutrient epigenetic therapy, and that was in 1990 when we developed what we call the metallothionine protein, uh, where we, we learned how to enhance genetic expression, the rate of expression of a gene. And that's becoming all the rage now. And, and even the, the, uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical drug companies are, are really starting to work at that. What's really new is the knowledge about glial cells. Glial cells. We, we've known since, 19, since 1826 that the brain has all these glial cells that pack around the neurons. And for about 100 years, people thought that was just to support these really delicate brain neurons, which are tiny got 80 billion neurons, similar number of glial cells. Well, what we're learning is that the glial cells are directly and intimately involved in brain function. They nourish the brain. The brain has these, these you, you know, every brain neuron or 80 billion of them all day, every day, they, they have nutrients coming in from the outside and they have nutrients coming in by genetic expression from that, from, from that neuron. 
and uh, the the both of these um, nutrients are important. And uh, when it's now becoming one of the lead theories of Alzheimer's is that the nutrient flow to the neurons is beginning to fail, and that's why some of these neurons are dying off quickly, like in Parkinson's or in Alzheimer's. I know I that. Think, I think that's. I think this has great hope for the future. This, the knowledge of this, now we, we, is, gives us a whole new number of targets for straightening out and correcting things in the brain that I think we can correct. And we can, we can maybe cut off a lot of these at the pass. I think these, we now know that cancer is epigenetic in, in nature, namely that uh, we used to think that people would have, everybody would have some cancer and at some time it would sort of take over. No, it's an event. Cancer is an event when, when uh, your DNA repair can't do the job and, and you develop uh, a permanent abnormal, um, uh, what they call a cancer stem cell that keeps cranking out the wrong chemicals and causing the cancer. Um, and it's epigenetic. And it's caused by, by DNA weakness. Um, and, and that's what aging is. Why do we age? We age because our DNA uh, loses integrity gradually. And we're beginning to know why. The main thing is we not, the problem with epigenetic disorders is when you get an epigenetic disorder like schizophrenia or cancer, what happens is that it's not just one gene that gets screwed up. You know, we have about 20,000 genes that make proteins to nourish us. We probably have 100 of them or more. And the problem is that makes a very complex disorder. This is why autism is so complex and why schizophrenia is so complex and, and so hard to treat and completely recover a person. You're fighting a battle on so many fronts. So that's the bad news. The good news about epigenetic disorders, they're relatively easy to prevent. We now have web tests that can identify if your DNA is weakened to the point that you might be approaching a, a breakdown onset of cancer or bipolar or schizophrenia. We, we now have inexpensive lab tests that can do that. I think that's the future. I think we can prevent schizophrenia and autism and cancer. I think within, I think, I think within um, 20 or 25 years, we might be able to eliminate them from society. I think we will. It's just a matter of understanding what causes it. And instead of having all, all these billions and billions of dollars aimed at how to fix it with, with these billion dollar medications, prevent it. And I think we have that ability now. We now have the knowledge. It's all in neuroscience that's published and it's out there for anyone to read. And no one seems to be interested because there's really no financial advantage in that. I think that's, that's sort of where we are. But I think it's gonna change. It's gotta change. We might be able to live to be 120 or 150 years old if this gets corrected. If we, if we learn how to protect our DNA, and we do know how to protect our DNA, but very few people do it. Then the people that do it well will be the ones who succeed and make the money. And hopefully we start to at least move towards that as a, as a species. How much of, how much of the, the damage theory and what you're talking about now is just mitochondrial dysfunction happening, essentially the, the powerhouses of our cells and all of us? Uh, part of it. It's certainly a part of it. We, we were investigating bipolar disorder for the last four years. And for two and a half years, we thought it was a mitochondrial disorder. We later learned, no, that's not really what's, wrong, what's causing uh, bipolar. We, we just published uh, our, 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 a new theory of, we think we know what bipolar really is now. And, we, and I'm writing a book on it that should come out in a couple of months. Um, and we presented that at the, at the American Psychiatric Association meeting. And we, I think we now understand exactly what it is and why it happens. Uh, mitochondrial function was a leading, that was the, our leading uh, suspect for a long time, but now we know that it's something else. But mitochondrial function uh, has been suspected for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, issues, uh, especially things involving apoptosis or death of brain cells, things like, like, like uh, Alzheimer's, for example. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the le leading candidates that the energy machine, you might say, in your, in your neurons is weakening. And you need that, 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 that power, that energy from mitochondria, which, is, which are uh, in, in, the, in the nucleus of every cell in your body. Uh, you need that energy for your cell to function. And if that goes wrong, you could expect uh, lots, of, lots of problems. 
so yes, it's it's a it's a I'd say one of the top three or four factors in a lot of these major diseases. But in the case of bipolar, we found it's not number one, and I don't think it's number one in autism either. Um, but it's certainly a really, you know, a really important thing that can go wrong. One thing I find very frustrating with health performance, everything really is, it's not necessarily one thing ever. It's always a, a combination of factors. We're, we're systems living in complex systems. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong and all of those interact. So like for instance, people that want to be healthy, they understand I can take this medicine and it will make me feel better. My, my foot pain will go away. But they don't think about the fact that the other things they put into their mouth also affects the, the internal chemistry and what's happening. People don't think about food as a drug, so to speak. How would you change healthcare if you could? Well, I think people need to know about biochemical individuality, that each, each human being is born different from the others. And it has to do with these things called SNP mutations, uh, the, the, the fact, and it has a lot to do with epigenetics, but also with uh, variations in genetics. And so we're all born different. Uh, we all have our own unique, unless you have an identical twin, you have, we all have a unique biochemistry. One of the first things I learned in clinical practice um, as a scientist trying to learn how to do uh, clinical work with doctors we were working with. My big surprise was I used to think that the big problem was deficiencies. Somebody didn't have enough calcium or, you know, whatever, and that they were they were low in and deficient in nutrients and that you could help them just by stuffing them full of vitamins and minerals and amino acids. And what I learned was that nutrient overloads because of genetics or epigenetics have caused more mischief than what you're deficient in. So you really can't help most people by giving them um, a, a great multivitamin mineral un unless they have a terribly deficient diet. You, you, you probably cause as much trouble as you can, you know, as good. Uh, for example, a lot of people, 68% of our violent people and hyperactive kids have a high copper level. Well, almost all of these, these um, multiple vitamin systems have a lot of copper in them they tend to make these people worse. Um, so you, it's a matter of individuality, finding out who you are biochemically. And we, we know how to do that quite well now, having done this for 30 years and with 30,000 people. One of, the, one of the problems I see is that in a lot of healthcare systems, the US especially, to be able to have access to a lot of these tests, either people are going to their doctor and the doctor has to write a prescription or people have no idea. How would you change the way that we go about individual biotesting on, on a genetic, on a nutrient, on a micro, uh, gut microbiome type basis to try to optimize humanity for the best people possible? Well, we need to start somewhere. And I think one thing we've been able to do now is we now have a battery of tests that cost about 300 bucks that, uh, that a lab could do. And I think that a family that might have a a, a child they're concerned about or an adult who seems to be developing a mental problem uh, to have the standard protocol of tests run just to see whether a person's a candidate for this kind of treatment. And then, and then uh, if they do, then they can, they, they should go to a doctor who is trained in these therapies. Uh, we now in the USA, we have 330 doctors that know how to do this scattered throughout the country. I think eventually there'll be tens of thousands of them. And that, that's what we're trying to establish to make this available to people. Um, but I, I think that really that this is what you have to do if you get warning signs. If you've got a child who's oppositional and defiant, or say you've got a beautifully behaved child who once in a while chronically has explosions, sort of Jekyll Hyde behavior. Or if you have a child that looks like they have autism or might have autism, or, or someone gets sad or a teenager starts cutting themselves, or you know, once you get warning signs, you really need, I think you need to look at their body chemistry and their brain chemistry and not just do counseling. I, I think counseling's the first approach. I really think that if you've got, a, for example, a teenager who seems depressed and you're worried about them, I think they should go to a, someone who, somebody, a psychologist or a counselor. And, and see if they can be helped with counseling, because sometimes it is a problem of living or bullying or something. But more often than that, you find that that's not the real issue, and, and they were, have an inborn tendency for that very problem. And, and um, I've had patients come in and said, no, I, I don't think you could help me because my whole family has this problem. I had one woman say that, that, her, that her, both of her parents were schizophrenic and one of her grandparents was a schizophrenic, and she was schizophrenic, and she said, I don't think you can help us. It's, it's genetic. 
And I told her, no, that's it's the opposite. If if it's genetic, that means chemistry. We can correct chemistry. If she if she was mentally ill because she got a whack on the head, we probably couldn't help her. But it, and the the wor- so we tell everybody the worse their family history, the more likely we are to help them because it's almost certainly a chemistry problem, a, a problem of chemical imbalances, and most of them we know how to correct them. How do you deal? How do you deal with parents? Excuse me, I didn't hear you. No worries. How do you deal with parents? So to be able to say to a parent, I, I have to imagine talking to a parent and saying, you could have fixed this. I mean, most parents, it, it's almost like ignorance is bliss. They can't accept the fact that they could have helped. So people almost want to avoid thinking about this as true. Do, do you see problems like that? Well, I think that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, not only seeing 30,000 patients, we've seen their parents many times. Uh, what happens is that uh, there's a skepticism in the beginning. A lot of the people we see, the children and adults, have been to a lot of doctors and without success, and they're skeptical, which is probably a logical way to believe. But um, so we, we convince them to give it a try for three months, and then after they get, if if someone gets better, and say you've got a, a 16 year old who's who's been terrible uh, in in behavior or has been hurting people. Uh, once they get better, I'd like to look them in the eye afterwards and tell them, you realize none of this was your fault. None of this was because of the way you parented this child. He was born with these problems. And then I like to tell the, the kid, it's not your, hasn't been your fault either. You had, you were born with this tendency and now, now we've corrected your chemistry and this is the real you. This is the way you're supposed to have been. Do you believe in fate? Well, the scientist in me, of course, has to be skeptical. However, personally, I do. I do. I know I was listening. Oh, go ahead. It's from personal experience, I guess. Uh, you cannot scientifically prove uh, the existence of a creator. But on the other, other hand, how do you say, where did all this stuff come from? The universe, the earth, us, whatever. Um, and, and our brains are not, are not powerful enough to even comprehend how that could happen. I mean, if you think of a Big Bang origin of the universe, well, what was there two years before that? And, and, um, and if you believe in the, the uh, you might say, the Buddhist system of a steady state universe, well, that's impossible to believe and comprehend and get our brains around. It's sort of like trying to teach a dog how to do calculus. There are some things that we, we just have, that we have limits to what, what our brains can achieve. So... Um, I don't say a whole lot about that. As a public charity, I'm not allowed to talk about religion or politics. They would, the government would strip away our, our public charity status. So I can't say much more than that. But personally, this is not from the Walsh Research Institute. From me personally, I do believe that, that we're here for a reason. And I think the main reason we're here is, as Albert Einstein once said, he was asked if he believed in God. And he said he believed in the God of Spinoza. And not, not a, an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud with St. Peter Wilkin and you at a gate, but a, but a more, um, you might say, complex entity. Um, and um, he was asked, um, do you believe in God? And are you supposed, what, are you, what are you supposed to do if there is a God? He said he believed that he was created for a purpose. And he, he said he was recorded as saying he felt he was here to help other people. That's what Einstein thought. Smarter man than me, so I guess I'll go along with that. Wilder hair too. Do you know Sam Harris? He runs a he runs a podcast. Uh, it's focused on consciousness, but he talks quite a bit about the concept of um, the free will, and I think it brings up what you're speaking about now in terms of mental issues and problems that people have, both within themselves and epigenetically, genetically, and nutritionally, hormonally, et cetera, that affect affect their actions. How do you think about the justice system? How do you think about how we treat people, how we rehabilitate people, how we punish people when a lot of your work would say it's kind of silly to hold people accountable for their actions? Well, when I was, uh, worked, I worked for 18 years in prisons with, with very violent people and I've been involved with the criminal justice system. And uh, first of all, it's, um, it's not a great system. It's not a great system. Uh, a lot of innocent people go f- are, are, are in jail. Um, free will. Uh, the question is, how much responsibility does a person have? 
Well, it depends. Um, I've had violent schizophrenics who could not control their violent tendencies. They didn't, they, they didn't have free will. They didn't have it. There are people with obsessive compulsive disorders who don't have free will. Unfortunately, that includes pedophiles who have an obsessive compulsive disorder. And if put in a situation where they have the opportunity to harm someone, it'll happen. Uh, the, the degree of free will varies from person to person. I think most of us have free will and we can choose whether to act or not act. Unfortunately, there are a number of um, very dangerous people who don't have free will. Um, as far as the criminal justice system, uh, it wasn't really uh, until about 75 years of our country that we even had prisons. We didn't put people in prison um, early 1800s. Uh, I think a lot of people are in jail that shouldn't be in jail. I guess especially in California, it's sort of bankrupting the state, the amount of people. And there, there are more people, there are more prisoners in California than any country in the world, including the United States. They just have so many. And, it's just, and they're all there they, for marijuana, which is now legal. They're, they're, there for, they're there for political reasons, being tough on crime. And they had a three, three and out rule where if you were caught with a third felony, you got life in prison with no parole. Well, that included par marijuana back then. I mean, it's crazy. Um, as far as rehabilitation goes, uh, the problem with rehabilitation is that implies returning someone to a condition of formal, former health. A lot of these people have never been healthy, especially the criminals. They were born violent and, and delinquent and, and it continued throughout their lives. So it's not a rehabilitation. I think it's more a correction of, of their brain function. You're not bringing them back to the past wellness. They were never well. Do you see these type of brain issues becoming more of a large scale in society? Is this becoming more of a problem? Well, I think it's to be more of a solution. Once we learn what it really is and how to correct them and how to, I think as far as, as um, people say, let's say somebody does something terrible, like a pedophile who may not have control of himself harming someone. I think, I think you have to have some basic rules. And to me, the number one rule is, the public must be protected. The public must be protected. Maybe you have to take people like that and send them off to some island in the Pacific where they can live a good life but not harm the rest of us. Uh, I'm not sure how that can be done, but I think the public must be protected. And um, I guess then the next question is, are we being protected by popping people in prison? Well, I was in prison as a volunteer working with hundreds of people uh, and I can tell you, it's not doing the job. I think there should be a sign in front of prisons that say, warning, this place may be dangerous to your health. The reason is, I mean, if, if you've got someone who committed a violent crime, say they attack somebody and hurt them. Can you still hear me, by the way? You're, You're good. I can't see you anymore. Okay. If you have somebody who harms someone and is now in prison, what we tend to do is uh, maybe lock them up for 10 years, put them in a cell, give, and then and, and after, after 10 years, you suddenly turn them loose and, and, and give them maybe $50 or $100 and say goodbye and expect them to be okay. If we had a dog in the neighborhood that was attacking people, do you think we'd put it in a cage and just keep it in a cage for a few months and then let it free? Let it go free? That, that makes no sense at all. And I think that's what we do with people to a large extent. And the whole issue of rehabilitation um, is, is uh, poorly done. I know in New York and in California, there are efforts in other states too to, to find a way to help people uh, not recidivate, not return to crimes. Most of the people I knew coming out of prison never wanted to go to prison again. And I would say more than half of them were determined never to commit another crime or put themselves in a situation where they, where they would wind up back in prison. And what they told me and what I learned was that a lot of them are hungry they're homeless. They might have had a family that was hungry, uh, and they knew how to make money fast. So I think that when, whenever we let someone out of prison, we have to do what we can to make it possible for them to have a job and to have a decent life so the temptation isn't too great, because most of them really want to turn their lives around. Then you have the career criminals, the sociopaths, the antisocial personality people, and I knew many of them. Some of my best, some of my best volunteers were, were sociopaths ex-convicts and they're um they're not going to change their their attitudes they they have a negative feeling of, about 
um, about the world. They have no feeling for other human beings, and they're narcissistic. They they um, they they care only about themselves, and they were born that way. I had I had a uh, a career criminal uh, like that who was a sociopath. I, I once had lunch with him on Michi on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And he told me he thought he was missing something in life. He said he sees people that love their mother and fall in love and walk hand in hand in the, in the moonlight. And he said, I, I feel nothing for anyone. He said, I never have. And he said, I think I wish I could, but I don't. And then he pointed outside and there was a, a bus uh, at, 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 at an intersection and a woman and a child crossing the street. He said, you know, I, I could be standing out there and, um, and, and, and this bus could just run people, uh, uh, the, the sociopaths in the world, what I've learned is that we have great success in helping children with that kind of chemistry. And I know from them contacting me later that, they're, that they didn't turn into a criminal. Uh, I think you have to take those people and get them young and correct those, their, correct those tendencies that, that, that are antisocial. And I think it can be done. What percentage of kids would you say have some type of issue similar or related to these well, in terms of academics, I think you're, you're up about 15 or 20%. Uh, we call it ADHD, whatever the term you want to use. But a lot of them have hyperactivity or they have inattention. Uh, they, I think, they, and by the way, we have really good success in helping children and adults with ADHD. Um, and a lot of that, and you can often fix that with nutrient therapy, just fixing their brain imbalances. Uh, maybe they need, a dr sometimes drugs help. And that's great. We're, we are not opposed to drugs. We just want people to be the best they can be. Uh, with respect to um, the, the, you know, the incidence of ADHD, um, there is a city in not far from where I live where 38% of all the kids are, are, are uh, labeled ADHD. There's the state of West Virginia, I believe it's somewhere around 30 to 35% are called ADHD. However, the Center for Disease Control they're arguing whether it's 5.6 or 10%. Uh, so there's a lot of overdiagnosis. Uh, but I, I think the real thing, the, the truth is that with respect to behavior, probably a solid 5 to 10%. And it can come mild, moderate, and severe. You can have a mild problem, moderate, or severe. The, in the mild problems, I think counseling can help. And, uh, and, 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 and improving the environment and really good parenting can help. And most of the behavior disordered kids um, are mild. But if you have a severe case, if you have the chemistry of a Charles Manson, and I, I, we interviewed and tested his chemistry, uh, I believe that you, if, he has that, if you have that kind of chemistry, you can't love it away. I think you have to treat it and you have to fix the chemistry because his chemistry was so abnormal. Um, uh, it, it, it just defined the way he behaved from the time he was 12 years old. How do you deal with that going forward? What, um, actually, no, what, uh, what technologies, trends, et cetera, are you most excited about outside of your own work? What intersects? What gets you excited? What do you like to read about? Really, uh, what I get thrilled about is the new science of CRISPR. I don't know if you've, if you've got any oh, CRISPR course. yet. Gene editing. Uh, now, this all started three years ago. In, I mean, it started in... in, in, in really in a big way, three years ago, with a Nobel Prize in chemistry by three, three people from three different parts of the world who, who learned about DNA repair. We now know that we have 30 trillion DNAs in our body, okay, that's the average person. And, and, if you, and if you take every one of these tiny DNAs and stretched it out, it would be more than a meter long, more than six feet long. If you took all your DNAs in your body and, and put them end to end, they would go to the sun and back 400 times. I mean, it just shows how, how, how much DNA we have and how complex it is. Um, what we've learned is that um, what they f we know is that our DNA is being assaulted and, 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 and ravished and ravaged between 10,000 and a million times a day, actually 10 million times a day, and, it get, and it's being ripped apart, uh, your, your fragile DNA. What, the, what this Nobel Prize uh, study and, and, and was for was 
they found out something really remarkable. Our DNA immediately gets fixed. You could have your DNA strands, their double, their double helix ripped apart uh, a thousand times in a second. It'll get fixed. It's just remarkable. And they learned, and what, the, what they got the Nobel for was they, they worked out the detailed um, mechanisms of how that happens. And it's fascinating and it's remarkable. It's like you got a, it's like we have a thousand repairmen in each one of our little tiny nucleuses fixing our DNA because it's constantly being ripped apart by cosmic radiation, by oxidative stress, by, you know, by, just, just by natural chemistry. So what that led, the, that led to, to CRISPR and what CRISPR is, that we now have an enzyme that they like to call a scissors enzyme. And if you put it in, in into a person and get it near a gene, it'll 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 cut the DNA. It'll it'll snip it. So we now know how to cut out, and at least briefly, uh, a, a gene. Well, we now have something called a guidance RNA, which is a, a an enzyme that now they know how to make. They know how to make this um, in a, in a laboratory, and what they've learned is that every single gene we have has like a fingerprint that has to do with um, what they call palindromic repeats. Uh, I don't want to get into, the, into gory details, but the point is that every uh, one of our 20,000 genes that make proteins um, uh, have distinctive, a distinctive uh, fingerprint sort of array. Um, and so you can, what they do is they make and they can create a, a uh, what they call a guide a guide RNA, which which and which they then have managed to connect with the scissors. And so, let's say you've got uh, somebody with Down syndrome, and you want to fix that particular gene that makes them Downs. Uh, you could then create create the right the right guidance RNA, put them into the body, a proper gene. Uh, it works. They started doing this with mice um, three, four years ago, and they had success. They could actually create serious diseases, genetic diseases in a mouse, and then they could correct it. They could edit the gene. They could remove the troublesome gene and put in a proper gene. Really exciting stuff. It's moving so fast. They quickly went to chimpanzees, and it seems to work beautifully there too. And then uh, about six months ago, they started working on human embryos putting, putting um, you know, correcting and editing genes in a human embryo. And now they're doing human testing just in the last, I think, six, eight weeks, human testing has begun. I'm not sure when they started, but it's happening throughout the world. It's exploding. That's what's really got me excited because a lot of, uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of orphan diseases that can really wreck a person's life and make it make their life short, or it can give them a really low quality of life. Uh, and we know the genetics. Sometimes these are just one gene that's going to miss. Wouldn't it be great to be able to, uh, at birth, uh, be able to fix that gene and not have that person develop that way? <clears throat> I really think that since uh, DNA, um, uh, loss of DNA integrity has everything to do with aging, and I think has everything to do with cancer and heart disease, I think people, we, we have a really great chance of future generations. I don't know how long it's going to take of people having a really good life, healthy life, up to at least 120, maybe beyond. Um, that, so that's the, that's the uh, area of science that has me the most excited. Oh, it's, it's hands down the most fascinating area right now, biotech, in terms of what's going to be happening in the next 100 years. It will be, uh, it will be otherworldly. How long do you think you'll make it? Let's, let's, let's go there. Do you think you're going to see some of the, the aging benefits and uh, longevity boosts of the technology people are working on today? Well, I'd really like to. I'd love to. Um, I've got longevity in my family. The Irish side of my family is, lives very long. I have an aunt that, that was 109, and she was mentally sharp all the way. I've got uncles, a number of uncles, uh, and an aunt who made it to 100. And that was, you know, that was 30 years ago. Um, right now, I'm 82 years old. Um, but if I'm like them, I've got another 20 or 30 to go, and I'm looking forward to it. Maybe if, the, um, if science can advance, it'll be even beyond. But I, I, I see the beautiful future in healthcare. I see the, not, not just mental health, but all of healthcare. And I, I'd love to see it um, occur and, and develop. Uh, it's gonna change a lot. 
a lot of a lot of industries are going to uh, fade away, and I think one of them might be the pharmaceutical industry, with time. Um, and I, but I think it's going to help society. I think it's a better life for everyone. For me, I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive. I I, I can't I, in the morning if I don't do a couple of Sudoku puzzles, the day doesn't go well. Uh, I'd, I'd rather not have that because that takes time. But there are all kinds of, of of genetic and epigenetic things that 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 if we didn't have them, they could be better. So maybe. Wouldn't it be great to take our unique DNA and be able to fix the parts of it that are harming us? We wouldn't all be the same. I mean, we, we've now had enough um, tens of thousands of years of, of DNA changing that our, DNAs, our DNA are, you know, from person to person, unless you've got an identical twin, are quite unique and different. So we will always be uniquely different. But wouldn't it be good to get rid of the disease genes? or fix that part of our DNA. I, I think it's coming. It's coming and uh, now there's an ethical problem with it. And um, even the research on human embryos has an ethical problem. And I think it's banned in the USA. But if we don't do it, someone else will do it. Uh, maybe France or Portugal or someplace. Uh, it's going to, ha it's coming regardless of what we decide to do as a country. Um, and the biggest problem with CRISPR and gene editing is what they call off target effects. Um, if they focus in on one particular gene that they want to replace, um, they have to make sure that they don't change one of these other, of, of the 20,000 genes, because if you, if you not only change and fix that one, you don't want to alter a hundred others. And that's the biggest challenge right now is to learn how to do this with specificity and not infecting the rest of your DNA. And that they may not be able to to fix that, which is of course a safety issue. So it's gonna take some time to prove that it's safe. But for people that have a, a you might say a, a disease with a death sentence, um, I, I think that they're gonna start using it. For example, Alzheimer's, a person now has Alzheimer's, uh, there is no cure and you have just a continuous downward slippery slope. And uh, within seven years on the average, the person will be dead. And um, I, I think with a condition like that, uh, a fatal disease with uh, with no real realistic hope of of of, of 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 a fix or a cure. I think I think we're going to start with them, and hopefully this will all be successful, and then we can all benefit eventually. I think we would all roll the dice if we were in that situation. And if I have a ten ten percent chance of getting cancer, then hell yes, I'm going for it. I know um, we've had you for a while now, Bill. Uh, I have one last question for you before before I let sure. you go, and that's if you could leave people with something, a quote, a call to action, something to look into, et cetera, what would it be and why? Well, health-wise, I think they need to know their biochemistry. And I, I, I think they need to find someone who, uh, and now there are hundreds of doctors quite expert at helping a person identify any chemical imbalances that are, that are, that are harming their life. I think they should do that. Uh, as a person, um, Personally, I think I think really what a person should do is I, I think we really do live to help each other, and uh, we have a uh, I have written a book that that might help them if they are interested in in the first first one called Nutrient Power. It's a um, it's been a bestseller on Amazon, and it describes uh, a lot of the chemi chemistry we've been talking about. It's available in seven languages and growing. Um, so Nutrient Power that's one possibility. Our website. It's walshinstitute.org if they want more information on this sort of thing. But I, I think really we need to learn to live together, and that's our biggest issue. And I, I'm, um, I think each of us should do our part and, and try to lead toward um, better relationships and help other people. There was one, at one point in my life, I was, uh, my family had a really major. Um, a really major crisis in my family and a lot of people helped me and I, I started helping, I, I started thanking them. And I thought, wait, this, this is too small. And so what I decided to do is not to thank anybody who would help me. And I just committed that every day of my life, I was going to try and help at least one person. I've been doing that for 40 years. And believe me, it, it really uh, makes life more beautiful. And I, I urge people to give that a try. I think that's a great takeaway. I think everything that you've done has been incredibly impactful for for humanity for mental health and i just want to add that 
when I get people on Fringe FM, guys, I'm a very skeptical person. Some of this may sound a little bit out there because it is against the mainstream medical industry, but I, I very much look into the people that we have on here and I am, I am nearly 100% convinced by what you guys are doing. It's very impressive. Keep up the, keep up the awesome work. Well, thank you, Matt. And thanks for coming on today, Dr. Walsh. Cheers, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully this has been fun. And if it has, you know what to do. Subscribe and check out the Walsh Research Institute if you've got anything you got to add.